Um, but we thought we'd start off um, tonight's proceedings with a bit of a discussion um, led by Rob Gordon. So I think most of you know Rob Gordon, can I say that? So yeah, Rob's out of Melbourne in Australia, or he's going to correct me which part of Melbourne it is. But um, he's been back and forth to Christchurch on, do I just say, numerous occasions. Um, but he also wanders around the world, if I can say wander, because I'm being a bit casual this afternoon, we'll get more formal at 5.30. <laughs> but he does wander around the world um, looking at how other communities go in disasters. Um, and I think he's been very thoughtful watching us and giving us on ideas and suggestions. But we've asked him to come along tonight and just talk about his observations about Christchurch and maybe some of the stuff we may be going through over this next period of time as well. Is that okay, Rob? So it's really great to have Rob here tonight. Thank you all for coming. Oh, thanks, uh, Roger. Uh, I'll just correct one thing. I wander around Australia and New Zealand rather than the whole world. That's big enough for me. <laughs> um, the thing that uh, impresses me is that in some respects every disaster is absolutely unique and in other respects they're all the same. Uh, and uh, coming here, I think this is my fifth or sixth visit here, uh, it's very interesting to see that combination of unique uh, features and similar features. It's as though there is a fundamental process or set of processes that are triggered by a disaster. But what we have to understand is how is that process shaped and how does it unfold with the particular circumstances in that culture, that community and those physical circumstances. And I think it's very important that we can keep track of where we are in a process. It's one of the most difficult things. Because I, I think we have uh, really three major problems. Uh, one is the, the actual event itself, which translates in the members of the community as the trauma, the horrible experiences. Um, and they keep reverberating. And we know that uh, a lot of the development of the traumatic responses is not just what happens on the event but how quickly you can begin to resume a sense of safety. Well that's a, very much a factor of what happens immediately afterwards and it was very difficult here because it was so overwhelming and uh, there were so many difficulties that it's very hard to actually bring people out of that trauma into a secure environment. So that's a, been a great challenge here in, in Christchurch. The, the second uh, problem is the loss and destruction and the gaps that are left in people's lives, in their families, but also in their finances, in the, uh, in the neighbourhoods and so on. And uh, there's a major task to come to grips with this loss. Um, the loss, uh, you know, in this case, the loss of landmarks, which really translate to personal history. I remember one of my earlier trips, somebody came around and uh, drove me around around the edges of the closed off CBD and said, uh, that's where the church was where I got married uh, and there was a pile of rubble and that's where I had my reception and there was a pile of rubble and so forth. So that, so that uh, in the early days there is this tremendous focus on the physical loss but it, it all actually has a social and historical meaning. But that begins to come through later in this sense of, of grief. And then, of course, the, the whole issue of people feeling they have multiple ownerships, uh, you know, that there's a legal ownership, uh, and then there's a cultural ownership, and, the, and then there's an emotional ownership of the Christchurch CBD. I've lived there all my life. I feel I own it. Therefore, I feel I have a stake in what's done here. How come this person is putting up a building that I haven't had a say in? Well, because they own the land. Yeah, but I own the landscape uh, in another way. And so these are things that I think it, we don't have very good cultural forms for understanding. And so what happens is instead of being able to reflect on them and think about them and communicate and engage, these, uh, these bruising experiences manifest as eruptions of emotion. And so we have this environment of emotion. And I think one of the challenges is how do we engage with that and try to create structured opportunities for people to uh, work through things, make decisions, participate. Uh, and this really means we have to educate our communities. 
And then the, the third one, I think, is, uh, is really more uh, nebulous, but also potentially more pernicious. Because whereas the trauma and the loss happen, and then you have the consequences, this factor keeps going, and that's the factor of disruption. Some uh, <coughs> couple of years ago, I set myself to try and uh, conceptualise what, what does social fabric consist of, social fabric that we understand is so severely disrupted with such enormous consequences in our ability to manage emotions, make decisions and so on. And I came to the conclusion uh, that it actually consists of the routinized activities we engage in without thinking about, which are organised by and give expression to our values, our personal values, cultural values and so on. And it's only by repeatedly expressing things in our lives that we really allow ideals and values to be embodied. And this is something that gets very easily swept to the side when we move into a kind of uh, emergency mode of just trying to improvise uh, daily life. We can do it for a while, but if we do it for a number of years, we are seriously in danger of actually forgetting those structures that formed the meaning of our life. And uh, what I've seen here is uh, we, we know that several years down the track people are getting very tired uh, and that tiredness prevents them from making good decisions. I think one of the unique things about uh, Christchurch and what I've been saying is that you've had a very untidy disaster because it's actually had a whole series of events over probably a year or two culminating with most recently the red zoning where there are these multiple impacts as opposed to a bushfire or flood where it happens and then it's finished and you can start recovering and so one of the factors is this uh, is how do we actually deal with this disruption and and this is where I think um, the disruption goes across the board and influences every aspect of life. But our systems tend to be uh, located in their own little silos because normal life allows us to differentiate everything and to have discrete responsibilities and we have a certain amount of communication, but basically they do their own thing. Whereas we know that after disasters everything influences everything else. And one of the challenges is how do we actually introduce a degree of flexibility to adjust and make exceptions uh, because the, the needs are never tidy, they never fit into the appropriate sets of criteria and so on. I see this as one of the major challenges. And I think uh, we see that when, when uh, people working in different parts of the system uh, meet these challenges, there's often a, a considerable degree of um, conflict in the minds of workers as to how far can I actually move outside my frame of reference. And I think this is a, a very important challenge for political and, and higher order managers to actually sort of grasp this and, and bestow on their uh, workers a, a sort of a, an appropriate understanding for this ability to move flexibly between systems. And what goes with that is the need to, uh, to have communication across systems that people don't normally talk to each other. Um, and we could give many examples of people working in infrastructure, for instance, who meet people who are obviously in a very high state of distress. And we find out later, much later, that they knew about this for a long time, but they never thought about talking about it. I remember uh, a, a, uh, a worker in the... Uh, one of the bushfire affected shires who was the woman who was manning the rubbish dump on uh, the, the week after Black Saturday. And we had some seminars last year with this, uh, you know, reflecting on emergency management issues with this council. And because this uh, CEO had got the whole staff to come to this session, she actually said, you know, after Black Saturday, I took it upon myself not to charge them the people who came with trailer loads of blackened rubbish. I took it upon myself to waive the tip fee. I did charge it to people who bring ordinary rubbish, but not to the bushfire people. I don't know whether I had the right to do that, but I took it upon myself. And she said, I would wander around and 
start chatting with people and I had to say something like, oh, that's a nasty cut you got on your leg. And they would spend 40 minutes debriefing what happened to them on the day and their life threat experiences. And she said, I never thought of even telling anyone back at the office. And this, you know, this gives a sense that she's probably, if they're taking their stuff to the tip, they probably haven't been enregistered. And certainly they haven't done any debriefing. So we should have had a registration tent and personal support people and possibly counsellors at the rubbish tip because that's where a whole cohort of people were going. And I think it sort of illustrates, it, it, in, in a sense, we, we learn this belatedly, but we can say it's one of the principles. And I think as we're in this stage, uh, you know, in some respects we could say you're in the third year, but in some respects you're in the first year of, uh, you know, halfway through the first year of the red zoning, aren't you? So there are multiple impacts here. <coughs> so that, uh, you know, in a sense there is this massive challenge uh, to enable a kind of holistic cross-referencing of systems that don't normally talk to each other. Actually, I've seen a lot of that happening here. And I think this is one of the uh, really important things that you will learn a great deal that, uh, uh, you know, I'll certainly tell stories in other environments about what I've seen happening here. You're having to, to learn this. Um, in fact, I think from my experience, and, you know, I haven't uh, encountered this before, of a, of a main city disaster, I think there are certain features that are, are quite different from a, even a large country town. Um, so I think many of the, the principles that are being enunciated uh, for the, uh, the strategy are uh, embodying these principles very well. The other, I think the other thing that uh, is characteristic of this event, which seems to me very different, is that there is a whole uh, dimension of the recovery process which is out of the hands of the people that it concerns, <coughs> the, the waiting for EQC and insurance processes, and even then the way in which uh, repairs uh, are having to be made, and very often people uh, have a sense of uh, personal impotence about this. And we know that impotence and, and a sense of helplessness is one of the most disturbing uh, elements. It, it used to be one of the key criteria of a traumatic experience, that the person felt absolutely helpless uh, to do that. And, and I think the, the waiting is a, is a major issue here because I think it really uh, creates a situation of increasing tension. And uh, as in some of my conversations, I've wondered whether in order to create uh, support for people, whether we shouldn't have a kind of, uh, some kind of messaging uh, to invite people to engage with support systems that goes along the lines of something like, uh, waiting is difficult. If you engage with our services, we'll help you wait. Uh, whereas in actual fact, the tendency is when you're waiting, you lock onto the goal and say, why can't this happen? Why can't this happen? Why can't this happen? And that means you're doomed to engage with a whole lot of repeatedly unsuccessful and very annoying experiences. And, and uh, this is one of the challenges, I think, with dealing with stressed people, is to disengage from the stressor and focus on how do I survive the stress? Uh, and and I, I, I see a lot of this happening. The All Right campaign is a, a very creative initiative. I think it's wonderful. Um, but as we see, uh, the, that uh, there are still large numbers of people who are locked into their anger. And that probably means that their lives are disrupted and losing these routines and, and so on and so forth. And so we know that it's probably only when their houses eventually are fixed that the consequences of those lost routines will start to manifest. And so uh, I think anything that can be done now to engage people in a series of support systems is laying the foundations for being able to support these people at a later stage when they're going to need it. Um, even if they're not open to it now, if we can engage them. And, uh, and I think, you know, we can't have a unitary uh, uh, focus on this, we have to have multiple uh, complementary systems to engage people in many different ways. Uh, and so uh, I, I think this, uh, 
th these would be some of the characteristics, and and that uh, your uh, you know uh, here's uh, very in very many places this sense that we're in for the long haul, um, but I think there is this sense of a phased process, and there is uh, it seems to me a time for a kind of uh, working on a social engagement process that will not only support people in this state but will uh, lay the foundation for being able to support them later when their problems are not so much around built, uh, the built environment but are around the social and the personal life. So, uh, um, you know, I'd say that um, there are many things I've observed here that are wonderful. I've taken a few photographs uh, of uh, things in the streets which uh, I'll show people in uh, Australia uh, as examples of uh, creative, uh, innovative uh, uh, initiatives. Uh, there are a lot of, a lot of evidence of uh, very public statements and symbols to uh, boost people's sense of optimism. Um, I don't see quite as many, you know, flowers in the, um, the witch's hats. Uh, uh, but, uh, and you, you could imagine that nothing will go on forever, but, but uh, you know, this process of reflecting to the community back to itself, its own resilience. Somebody said to me um, the, this morning that uh, he hears people saying uh, they get very frustrated that nothing's changing, it's the same. And he said, actually, if you look, there's something different every day. And we have this also with uh, disaster affected people talking to their friends and relatives outside the community. The friends and relatives tend to say, you know, you're going on and on about the same things, let's talk about something different. But actually people need to talk repeatedly and what I say when I get a chance to talk to these people is to say, listen carefully. I know a lot of it's boring because you've heard it all before, but listen for two things. What are they saying that they didn't say before? And what are they not saying that they did say before? 80% of it might be the same, but that's actually where you see the progress. And I think one of the things that's very important in this community is that people are able to notice and identify what's changing and, and see that growth, not only in the built environment, but in what's happening in the community. And I think that uh, this is really a matter of focus. And that's where I see these symbols as uh, working, and I think this has been a very creative uh, community in that regard. So uh, uh, it's, uh, I feel it's a real privilege, it's a great learning experience to come here, and I, I thanks very much for the invitation. <laughs>